Good evening. It is my pleasure and a privilege to be moderating this event. We have an interesting talk in store by Professor Yogi Delugian on Armenia, a host country. I will be introducing Professor Georgi shortly. In the meanwhile, we have a special visit today by Veronica Zonabend, who together with her husband, Ruben Vardanyan, are the founders of UWC Dilijan. Under their leadership, the institution has grown into an oasis of learning, teaching, living together, and exploring in turn Armenia, our host country. They built the state-of-the-art facility in Dilijan in the most beautiful location with a vision for the future. They shaped the school for the type of education that is crucial for the world today. And they are being tested once again. The geopolitical situation today is no less complex and challenging for Ruben and Veronica personally than it is for this part of the world as a whole. As the Soviet Union collapsed, Ruben and Veronica found themselves in a new environment and faced it with resilience in a true UWC spirit, as we would say, applying their business acumen and entrepreneurship skills to, in a new direction to philanthropy. Professional success has not been the only driving force in Ruben and Veronica's lives. With their success came responsibility, which they both embraced. They are using their personal largess and their talents to make a difference in the lives of others. Leadership is all about service and self-sacrifice, and this is not a cliche. Veronica and Ruben continue to demonstrate that through their lives and living. Over to you, Veronica. You have always been an inspiration to us and you will be no less today, I'm sure. Veronica. Oh, yes, thank you, Gautam. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, so we live in the history and uh, the events unfolding today in Artsakh and Armenia, the host country of UWC Dilijan, are participated by history. That is why the talk by Professor Dirlugian today is especially poignant. I hope that our community can learn about and from Armenia's history and that our Artsakh and Armenian students are reminded about the gener uh, generations of those who showed strength in face of all the difficulties they faced. Armenia is at their crossroads of civilizations and UWC Dilijan was created as the place of our excellence in education that helps people to understand each other and to find peaceful solutions to all possible conflicts. So what we see now, unfortunately, goes into different way. Therefore, it's important to find the solution even in that complicated, at least situation. And maybe my special words to Armenian and their Artsakh students to say never give up because there is always possibility to find the way. And it's very important to be strong and uh, to rely on your own will and on your own belief that you can resolve whatever happens and that our fate is in our hands. So thank you, George. And uh, now I then uh, give all over to Gotham. 
Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Before I introduce uh, uh, Professor George de Lugian, uh, let me mention that Ruben, as many of you might know, has been an Atsak on Nagorno Karabakh, as it is called, since November 2022. He chose to stay in Atsak to fight for the cause he believes in, to assert the rights of its people for a life with dignity in their native land. Ruben's self-sacrifice is exemplary, often at the cost of personal safety. Veronica, on behalf of all of us, do convey to Ruben our solidarity with him and his people in this hour of trial. And now, Professor De Lugian, a warm welcome for having spared your time out of your busy, busy, very busy schedule, I know, to be with us today. It's a special day on the eve of Armenia's National Day, which we celebrate tomorrow. The celebration this year will no doubt be somewhat somber with the rapid political developments around us, while we remain still hopeful of positive peace. We wait to hear Professor Delugian take us through a journey, tracing Armenia's checkered history and heritage through its struggles and aspirations, helping to place the present political situation in its context. Professor Georgi has spoken before to our community, and it is an added privilege for me to be moderating his talk today for the second time. We hope the session will be interactive. We shall be inviting questions from our audience for Professor De Lugian to answer after his brief presentation of 20 to 25 minutes. I shall be moderating the questions from you as they come in. Please do feel free to ask them. I now request Professor De Lugian to speak and engage with you. Georgie. Thank you, Jota. Uh, dear audience, it's a double challenge. As you realize, let's try to cope with it. It's both emotional and time constrained. Uh, for you, probably to make better sense of what is Armenia and the Armenians, even if you are Armenian, including those who are Armenian, by descent or adoption. Uh, let me start by drawing comparison. Uh, from the times of ancient Roman Empire, we have actually several nations surviving around it. You know, they're kind of satellites in Rome itself uh, as empire has long been gone, although it has a Catholic church as the city of Rome, it's still there. Within its orbit, several nations formed in the first centuries of common era. Might you be surprised, probably not, no, that these are Jews and Greeks, but also Coptic Egyptians, Christian minority today of Egypt, but also the Irish. Why the Irish? Because this is what remains of a previously a very large group of numerous and rather diverse peoples called the Celts, Celtic peoples. There are a few other Celtic peoples left uh, in the fringes of British Isles, a little bit in France, but basically Irish. Well, we might speak about the Basques, but they didn't really, they, obviously, you know, a very old lineage, according to their language, you know, however, uh, not much of a separate state or church. But if you pay attention you know, to what Armenians have in common with the Celts, uh, Greeks, Jews, and Coptic Egyptians, it's a separate religious organization. That religious organization emerged, and I am a sociologist. In sociology, we joke that what we do is organizational materialism. We are very materialist. We are not so much about ideas. Uh, you might 
have this wrong impression from some textbooks of sociology, we're not so much about values and ideas as about the organizations that organize and carry, you know, that uh, create the platform for ideas and for people coming together. So sometimes uh, I'm asked by sincere, not very far thinking people, uh, which is the most ancient nation on the planet? They probably think I would hint at their own nation. No, I tell them it's probably the Hoysan or Bushmen people in Southern Africa. So they ask me, you know, who are the purest blood? I said, definitely the Aborigines of Australia. You know, if your population remains in isolation from um, the rest of the humanity, maybe like Andaman Islanders, some Northern peoples, yes, you would have this kind of pure blood. Is there much to brag about it or to be ashamed of it? You know, it's simply population genetics about it. So there is not much that special about Armenia and Armenians. However, there is. So what it is that Armenians, like many peoples in the orbit of Roman Empire, they really come together in a certain period, which we call early Iron Age. We are speaking about the first several centuries before common era, BC. So this is after the fall after, uh, of Urartu kingdom, which gives us the name of Ararat. You realize they know the Hebrew Bible was written in consonantal alphabet, you know, which relates only consonants. R, R, T. You know, how did they pronounce it? Urartu or Ararat? So some people prefer to say kingdom of Ararat. So the name actually comes from Old Testament. Uh, that's pretty old. However, nowhere as old as ancient Egypt, as uh, Mesopotamia, just don't get me wrong. Something happens in the several centuries uh, BC. People come together and so something crystallized. It's a very interesting process to me, at least as a sociologist. And please, I'm telling you this, don't get me wrong. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not an analyst of current affairs. I'm actually interested in the history of social power and social organization. So I study just as much and my main interest is actually back then, 3000 years ago. I just had to give a lecture on why Arab nation is about 3000 years, but not five, not 50, as you might hear from some hotheads. And very much the same applies to the Armenians. So Armenians are about 3000 years. And then we don't actually know much for sure because Armenian language was not recorded. Uh, if they ever re really recorded anything, it was in ancient Greek language or in Aramaic. By the way, the language was Jesus Christ had he existed, spoke probably because Hebrew had been extinct by that time. Uh, then Latin. As you probably know, uh, just outside Yerevan, there is this beautiful Hellenistic temple at, in Garni, dedicated to Apollo. But at the same time, it's Mihr, Mihran, and a common Armenian name today. Uh, so Armenians do preserve, you know, this you know very interesting uh, mixture of ancient influences. Sometimes, you know, most of them are Iranian, and sometimes they're extinct in Iran itself, like. Names, for instance, Arshak, common Armenian names, or Artazurks, which Armenians pronounce as Artashes. So sometimes I, I joke in better times, I joke to my Iranian guests saying that, and guess what's the name of our taxi driver? Could it be an, a very ancient imperial name from long before Islam? Iran converted to Islam and lost such names. Armenians actually preserved them. Uh, this was almost everything was lost in uh, the great turbulence in human history, which uh, uh, occurred at the time of the collapse of Roman Empire. Uh, we call it the great migration of whole nations. And at that time, you probably realize, you know, that 
uh, England became Anglo-Saxon. And uh, Roman Britain was not Anglo-Saxon, it was Celtic. France became France, Frankish, the, the country of Franks. Uh, it was not. It was Celtic, and then it was Latin Celtic. At some time, you know, and very much the same happened with Eastern Roman Empire. Byzantium, they never called themselves Byzantium. Actually, no, they called themselves Rome. Romanoi. Uh, they spoke Greek or kind of iteration of Greek language that existed at the time. And actually, many of their noblemen, emperors, warriors were ethnic Armenians. Uh, I don't have much time, and therefore, instead of theory, I will give you a small anecdote. Do you realize that patron saint of Maastricht, you must have heard of this city famous for the European Union today. The patron saint of Maastricht, the founder of Christianity in Maastricht, was an Armenian. You can look it up even in Wikipedia. How could this happen? Well, easy. Uh, that Armenian was actually a military doctor and he served with the Roman legions and Romans had those excellent roads. And so he was transported and he walked probably all the way from Armenia to Maastricht, where he became a local legionary doctor and the founder of Christian church. Now, uh, Armenians converted to Christianity very early on. Uh, some would say even earlier than the Roman Empire itself. That's actually contestable. Uh, however, you know, Armenian Christianity is rather peculiar. It's neither Orthodox, you know, so people always ask me, you know, so what kind of Christianity? So is it Orthodox or Catholic? No, it actually separated before this, much before, like 600 years before the split of Orthodox and, and Catholics. And that split is actually very easy to explain. Roman Empire had four, four great cities. Rome, your Catholic church. Constantinople, that's your Greek Orthodox church. Antioch, that city was destroyed in Syria. That's your Eastern Syriac church. And Alexandria in Egypt, that's your Coptic church. Uh, Syria and Egypt later become Muslim countries or predominantly Muslim. However, Armenian Christianity derives probably from Syria. It has its own alphabet, uh, which was probably, again, uh, probably, I, I, nobody knows for sure, uh, probably inspired by the uh, ancient uh, Aramaic and some other probably Semitic alphabets because the order of letters is the same. Uh, Aleph, Beit, Gim, A, B, C, later it becomes A, B, C in Latin. Uh, why is it a different church? My explanation, once again, is materialist. So, of course, Armenian, patriotic Armenian explanation might be because we are always a special people. My explanation is quite uh, simple because Armenia, or when kind of kingdoms of Armenia, there were several kingdoms of Armenia existed, they had to balance between much bigger powers of their time. That was Roman Empire and later Byzantium on one side and Persia or some kind of Persia, Parthian Persia, Sasanian Persia, different dynasties, different kind of Persias, uh, later the Arab Caliphate on the East. If you are balancing between the two, uh, you will be damned to adopt the religion of one of them. So that's why Armenian Christianity is not like Greek. We are not Byzantine, but it's not like Zoroastrian, to remind you, you know, Zoroastrian flame worshipping. Uh, it still exists to a very small degree. It exists, you know, this religion exists in India and in Iran. Uh, to some, uh, they're called Parsis. Uh, otherwise, you know, Armenia was, you know, kind of part of this wonderful late antiquity world. Much of its treasures go back to that, its cultural inventiveness, its churches, its unique style of music. But then everything was lost and obliterated in the medieval invasions, one after another, like grinding wheels of world history. Just like England became Anglo-Saxon. Will you be surprised that it was not always Anglo-Saxon? Just former territory of Armenia, which was much larger than what it is today, 
just like Syria became an Arab country, it was not always Arab country, like Mesopotamia became Arab uh, speaking Iraq. It was a Semitic country, but not exactly that in ancient times. So much of uh, Armenia became populated by uh, shepherding, mostly shepherding tribes of medieval Turks, Turkic peoples, nomadic people on horseback, to some extent Kurds, you know, who are native people, also Indo-European, uh, to correct this, uh, Armenian language is Indo-European, so you realize this, you know, so huge expanse of languages, I was explaining today to my students from Bangladesh and from Iran and England, that they, they have related languages. You'll say in Sanskrit, cow is, as I understand, gobe, Armenian cow, cow is the same in English, or the Russian word for beef is govyadina, or chien is do dog in French, shun is Armenian, shenok, puppy in Russian, for instance. Okay, to get over with that, uh, Armenian legacy was largely lost with the territory, with the, uh, with the kingdoms supporting it, because you have to realize, you know, somebody must be paying for churches and monasteries. Somebody must be subsidizing institutions of medieval learning. How did that happen? Europe was lucky. Western Europe was very lucky. Mongols never reached France. They turned around. It's a big mystery. Why did Batu Han turn around in the middle of Poland and Hungary? He destroyed the Balkans, but he came back, went back to Mongolia. They destroyed uh, Baghdad. They destroyed much of Armenia. And ever since then, we haven't had a kingdom of Armenia. Only in early modern times, when Europe began rising, and I gave you already one hint why England and France, very lucky to be spared, they were among the few civilized medieval kingdoms to be spared the depredations of nomadic invasions. China was not. China was actually very much destroyed uh, in the 13th century. It came back. Yeah, China is huge. It bounced back. But the only other end of Eurasia which, did, which survived was Japan. You see the connection? Japan and England. These will be two countries. Northern India was absolutely destroyed. It became Delhi Sultanate. You know, so we don't have actually very many examples. So, uh, so medieval period was, it has, it enjoys duly a horrible reputation. It's unfortunately, it is deserved. I don't have time to explain to you why. But I have to tell you, you know, that it actually ended. Not exactly in a very happy instance when the West, as we know it today, conquered the rest of the world. India became British, China became semi-colony, Iran was divided between England and Russia, and so forth. And only Ottoman Empire was kind of you know, on its last nails, you know, still lingering there. And Subordinate peoples in the Turkish Ottoman Empire begin realizing that they have glorious historical lineage. Greeks started realizing that actually ancient Greece were their ancestors. So we are the progenitors of Western civilization. Why then are we subordinated to Turkish Sultan, who is not just brutal, but so backward? Uh, likewise, even Arabs, you know, being Muslim, you know, the, but they started having these ideas, you know, that maybe if we could get an independent country of our own, we used to have, you know, this great legacy of the Caliphate in early Muslim era, or actually we were literate before Islam, even, you know, Arabs go back much longer before Islam. Same realization, uh, of course, among peoples like Bulgarians, Serbians, Romanians. Pay attention to the name, Romania, Rome. We are Romans. Why are we subordinated? You know, and why are we so backward? And very much the same uh, idea among the Irish. Why we don't have our own Catholic, our Gallic-speaking own country, our nation. 
Why are we part of United Kingdom? Uh, they began rebelling. They began, you know, first dreaming about freedom, then rebelling, writing books, writing poetry, great music. Uh, their fortunes much depended on contemporary geopolitics. The Irish were among the least lucky, as you probably realize. They were too close to England and too much at, at the heart of British Empire. So they would be rebelling wave after wave well into the 20th century. But then it succeeded. Why did it succeed? Because World War I changed so many things. You know, it, it basically meant the collective suicide of European imperial powers. Without World War I and World War II, there would never be an independent India, perhaps. There would never be probably a communist China, an independent China. So likewise, Armenia emerged out of World War I, but a terrible genocide because the dictatorship then in charge of young Turks, so-called young Turks in charge of Ottoman Empire, from their standpoint, rightly saw that every time a minority rebelled against Ottoman rule, they were losing territory like Greece, sometimes crucial territory. They were losing territories like Romania, but at, by 1918, this became totally intolerable. Uh, before 1918, at least formally, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem belonged to Ottoman Turkish Empire. Think about it. it what it must be looking at the world map from the standpoint of Mr. Erdogan or any Turkish nationalist, Kuwait, Iraq were parts of Ottoman Empire just a hundred years ago. So when Russia and Ukraine fight over the Crimea, the Turkish nationalists might just shrug their shoulders. It's neither you nor them, it's us. It's the Crimean Hanate. It's our patrimony. We were great and we want to be great again. Uh, Armenia, Armenians were decimated as I would say just a preventive measure to prevent rebellion during First World War on, be, uh, on the side of uh, the countries that of powers that could be Armenian allies, France, Russian Empire, perhaps even Britain, which was not ter terribly friendly, you know, but in uh, 1914, they found themselves uh, against the Ottomans and the Ottomans were on the side of Germany and uh, Austro-Hungary. The Ottomans lost almost million, maybe a million and a half Armenians, perhaps as much as half of the population was, were killed, brutally killed. So today, almost all Armenians are the survivors of the descendants of the people who survived genocide. This leaves an extremely deep impression on any national psyche. Uh, Republic of Armenia, for better or worse, and I think it's for better, was integrated in the communist Soviet Union. As you probably know, Joseph Stalin was an ethnic Georgian. Next to him were people like Anastas Mikoyan, ethnic Armenian. There were quite many Armenians there. And many of those Armenians, by the way, from Karabakh or from Southern Armenia, from Sunni. Uh, a question which I bet very few in this audience a very few starting with ethnic Armenians would be able to answer because I tried this before. Who was Hamo Yolan? Anybody knows? The answer is the most important Armenian in the Second World War. He was the deputy prime minister of Soviet Union under, the, uh, Stalin, under Stalin in um, Second World War. He is the man who managed to organize Ford-like production, like Henry Ford manufactured cars one after another, Hamo Yolan uh, managed to organize the production of gun barrels, more than 100,000 gun barrels. There was a monument, there's still a monument outside of Moscow in Elektrastal city you know, to Hamo Yolan. There are monuments to him, there were uh, monuments in Karabakh. They are now demolished by Azerbaijani troops because he was ethnic Armenian. He was educated in, in Baku, which later becomes Azerbaijan, but Baku was a very international city. It was one of the earliest centers of oil production in the world. How important? One half of 
oil production at around 1900, turn of 20th century. One half was standard oil belonging to John D. Rockefeller, as you realize. The other half, the Nobel brothers, you heard about the Nobel Prize, their cousin. Swedish entrepreneurial family with roots in Russian empire. They started you know, this business in Baku. Lots of Armenians made their careers and fortunes as well in the oil booming Baku, and which explains why by 1989, collapse of Soviet Union, there were quarter million ethnic Armenians in Baku alone. And there were probably half a million of ethnic Armenians in Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan. And there was a territory of kind of consolidated, actually very ancient Armenian uh, ethnic group in Karabakh, kind of consolidated, which the Soviet rulers did not know what to do without, with it. You know, and their thinking was actually very modernistic, very communist. Ethnic conflict, ethnic hatred, comes from backwardness. Where was the best industrial hub in the Caucasus, in their view, in the 1920s? Obviously, it was Baku. So why don't we attach Karabakh, this mountainous Karabakh, to Baku? Because majority of Armenians in Baku were originating from Karabakh anyway. These are your people. So why don't you help them? And I do believe, you know, that there used to be more Armenians in Baku than in Yerevan. Yerevan was an insignificant, small, quite dusty, backward place. So in a sense, it was not kind of ill will on uh, behalf of Stalin or other communists. You know, they were thinking about creating a world superpower, industrial and scientific. And they did not envision that Soviet Union could ever fall apart. However, it did, in part because Armenians actually decided to demand in 1988, once democracy is kind of offered by Gorbachev, uh, why there is such a strange thing, you know, that there is an enclave of ethnic Armenians within Azerbaijan called Armenian Autonomous Province of Mountainous Karabakh, or Nagorno Karabakh in Russian. And then there is Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic. And between them, like 24 kilometers. Why not merge them together? This sounded very easy. It actually led to very violent reaction in Azerbaijan. It led to a population exchange. There were many ethnic Azerbaijanis, or people we now call Azerbaijanis. They were Muslim. They were Turkic, Kurdish. Iranian speakers uh, who lived in many places in Armenia, including in Yerevan. You know, this is why, you know, the claims of current uh, dictator in Baku, you know, that Yerevan is our town, not his, you know, not, not, no more than Baku, you know, but you have to realize that the ethnic map was very spotted. So it was pretty much as violent as, as and horrible as partition of India at some point. So, okay. Christians on one side, Muslims on the other side. Um, Armenians mobilized in the early 1990s for the war for Karabakh and actually won because Azerbaijan was disorganized. Armenians were very inspired and the people who know that they are fighting against another genocide, they could fight like hell. Uh, I wouldn't go into other explanations, you know, that Russia intervened, you know, this is the usual uh, kind of explanations, you know, but my, question was always, you know, what was Russia in 1992? Are you kidding? You know, so Yeltsin, President Boris Yeltsin, barely controlled his own, you know, environs in Moscow. You know, he was fighting with his own parliament. Um, probably what is happening right now. So in 2020, you know, and the this is the last part. You know, let me jump, you know, to my conclusions. Um, Armenia, as Azerbaijan, as Georgia, suffered terrible losses and in deindustrialization because they were all parts of one huge military industrial complex. Military is probably not a good thing. Industrial, many people think, is a great thing. How do you think all those beautiful big avenues were built in Yerevan? And trust me, in other capitals of the former Soviet Union. Those big factories and universities and universal education was provided and scientific centers. You know, these used to be the countries sending people into, uh, into space. 
Yerevan was a center of sciences and culture. In the 1990s, it all collapsed for the very simple reason, there would be no money in the new puny government you know, to support any of uh, such outsized cultural elite. And there would be simply no electricity even to run classes in the evening. Uh, by the way, Azerbaijan suffered even more grievous losses because much of their cultured elite, much of their technological elite, the administration were ethnic non-Azerbaijanis, not only Armenians, ethnic Russians, ethnic Jews, who'd been expelled or fled in terror. So Azerbaijan today is a very different country from the Soviet Azerbaijan of the 1980s. You have to realize that as well. Azerbaijan is a very sad trajectory of returning to the uh, third world. It used to be one of the most forward looking Muslim country. It was the first Republic in the Muslim world. It was the uh, seat of the first comic opera in the Muslim world. And I can go on and on. Uh, much of it was the, uh, in Soviet times, it was famed for its jazz music. Almost all that is gone. So we are talking about terrible demodernization. And as an explanation for very corrupt and very ineffective, very ruinous regimes emerging in the 1990s and 2000s, both Azerbaijan and Armenia had to explain to their population that, however, you know, we are fighting a war against another. In Azerbaijan, they also had more explaining to do because it's an oil exporting country still. So where are the billions of dollars? Might ask the Azerbaijani population. It's amazing enough that Armenia and Azerbaijan have per capita the same incomes. So where is the money? That would be the question to the ruler in Baku. You know, how come your 11 year old son visits Dubai and buys in a binge, 38 villas. That's why the war in Karabakh. That's why ethnic cleansing. That's why uh, President of Azerbaijan gets himself in a, a new lease of political life. I am pretty sure that he's going to end badly because such regimes never end well. But when is that? You know, the most difficult thing is to predict what is going to happen. I am also reasonably optimistic about Armenia, precisely because it has no oil. It still has that rather educated society. It has this, well, the testament is the IT industry and the way Armenians have greeted the Russians fleeing from war last year. One of the Russians in, a, in my home in Yerevan, we had 12 people coming to dinner. So one of them asked my wife, why do you tolerate us? We are a burden. Many of them had never seen me before. And my wife said, we are Armenians. We understand what is war and how do people become refugees. That was all very simple. So what are we facing in Karabakh is, of course, right now, ethnic cleansing. That's the name for it. What can be done? Unfortunately, I do not share the optimism that anything can be done, that if you wish, you can achieve the sky, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry. You know, there are material limitations. I'm not a poet, I'm a social scientist. It's like engineering. I can tell you what is possible and what is not. However, to be totally grim and say that everything is lost and everything is bad, you just need to listen to taxi driver. To see a way forward, you probably need a professor of New York University. So I can tell you, you know, right now, what we are looking at, we need to extricate, we need to save in an organized manner, as many people as we can, starting with the young men who could be massacred right now in the trenches by vastly more numerous and better armed forces of the enemy. We need to get the women and children out. I'm sorry, I've been saying this for several years now, ever since 2020, you depend on Russia and Russian geopolitics. But when we say Russia, we know the name, of that man who is making the decisions. I'm sure it's one man and we pretty much know. You know, we don't know what is on, on his mind because like many autocrats, he's making mistakes. The guy in Baku, Ilham Ali, is also making mistakes. He will end badly, as I said. However, in the meantime, they are both going to do a lot of harm. What should we be looking for is 
consolidating the Armenian nation. Not everything is lost as long as you have a functioning country. Educated society, it must be protected. It must never be poor because without money and without educated people, you never can defend the country. How heroism comes into the picture, look at Ukraine. You know, with much inferior forces, they managed to survive. Here is an, an example. We must study that. Armenia, in my opinion, in 10 years, will be doing much better than the neighboring dictatorship. But we must survive those 10 years. Good luck to us all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Georgie. In fact, uh, questions have started coming in. Uh, I'm sure there'll be many more. Uh, oh. I will begin with a second question, not that I won't ask the first question that came in. Uh, it relates to your presentation also. The question is, in relation to the unfolding situation, has Russia undertaken to protect the Armenians of Nagorno Karabakh in exchange for Armenia adopting more Russia friendly policies? Uh, the question should not be about will. The question should be about capacity. Can Russia, or what's left of Russia, uh, in my opinion, and this is my very political opinion, Mr. Putin is the second reincarnation of Mr. Gorbachev. This may sound very implausible to you, but Mr. Gorbachev was a nice guy, a Democrat, friend of the West, he ruined the Soviet Union. Mr. Putin came to power and he's doing his best to be different. And yet he's recapitulating the same ruinous path. I think Russia is going into a disaster. We don't know the magnitude of disaster yet, but it's a disaster and Russia is losing its position all around it. It didn't look like that just three years ago. I think that's why Mr. Putin got carried away because as late as 2020, to remind you, August 2020, surprising outcome of elections in Belarus. President Lukashenko, who been kind of so easygoing, father of the nation, has been there forever, and big friend of some of the winemaking oligarchs in Armenia, lost, obviously lost the election to a bunch of women. And those very angry Belarusians, or Belarusians, call them now, you know, had to be beaten, literally beaten with batons by special police into submission. And that could be achieved only with some external help. Okay, Belarus was backed by Moscow. Next, September, October 2020, comes Karabakh, and, and that was a brilliant move. Armenia, but also Azerbaijan. With Azerbaijan ended up having four armies in its territory in 2020. Its own Azerbaijani National Army, the Turkish, Turkish Special Forces at the very least, Russian peacekeepers, and Armenian Defense Forces. Four, that's just official. Unofficially, also Pakistani mountain scouts, and Israeli, we don't speak about who. How could they survive with that? And next, I remind you, January 2022, Kazakhstan. Russian peacekeepers and Armenian peacekeepers at that time. That was just a year and a half ago. Going to Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev, and after Nazarbayev's regime collapsed, and look how spectacularly it collapsed. What was there left? Well, Uzbekistan, maybe Ukraine was left. So with it, it was very puzzling why Russia would send its best troops to Kazakhstan and then withdraw so soon. Because superpowers, when they send their troops abroad, they never withdraw. Look at the American military bases in Germany or in Japan. They've been there since 1945 and probably in perpetuity. Russians withdrew from Kazakhstan very quickly. Why was that? It was everyone's guess. And now we know the answer because they needed, there were not so many uh, crack troops as we thought, they were needed in Ukraine. And that failed within the first week. That's why Russia is actually very dependent on Turkey and Azerbaijan 
uh, Russia would not be, even if they wished, they would not be able to influence Baku. The West, likewise, what can they do to Baku? And so what would be the sanctions that would scare Azerbaijan right now? But in the longer run, I think you know, Azerbaijan is twice as doomed as Putin's regime in Russia because it's it already drove the country into backwardness. Azerbaijan, to finish, has three problems. Oil, Aliyev, Erdogan. Oil, Aliyev, and Erdogan look today like advantages. You have authoritarian rulers, and you have oil petrodollars. You have Turkish army. Are you sure that 10 years from now, these assets would not become liabilities? Let me end this answer here. Thank you, Georgie. In fact, uh, more questions are coming in. I, I, I will go to the first question that came in. It says, thank you very much for the enlightening talk. Do you have any thoughts on what is next for Artsakh and for Armenia? You have partially answered this question, I think, in your presentation, but then added to it, can I also ask, uh, how do you explain the rise of nationalism and ethnicity uh, with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union? Oh, two great questions, you know, each one meriting several dissertations. Thank you. Um, the collapse of Soviet Union, like greatest catastrophes in history, was not anticipated by anyone, especially the elites. And I can give you three examples. French Revolution in 1789, that was one of the most sophisticated political elites ever in history. Could you ever seriously propose to Cardinal Richelieu or his descendants that somebody like Robespierre could become the dictator of France? That's why it happened. World War I, as I said, it was the mutual suicide of European powers. Could the British, German, French ever believe that they would not be able to win a war? And that's why it happened. And that's why not it was a disaster, not necessarily terribly bad in the longer run. That's how we got you know, independence of so many countries. And collapse of Soviet Union was completely unforeseen. And that's why, you know, Armenians, or Armenian intelligence, I wrote a whole book, you know, please, uh, if you have patience, uh, it's called Bourdieu's Secret Admirer in the Caucasus. Parts of it, by the way, are regularly uh, downloaded, as I can see, by nameless readers in Azerbaijan. They are very welcome to read about their own country. This is my analysis of Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia. Georgians read a lot of it now. I'm very pleased. When I was writing this in the late 1990s, I thought it was commentary on current affairs. Now it's history. But it explains this strange paradox why first president of Armenia was Levon Terpetrosyan, who was a medieval manuscript scholar. But so was the first president of Azerbaijan after communist, El Chibay. He was a scholar of medieval Fatimid dynasty poetry in Egypt. The Minister of Defense of Azerbaijan was a physicist, Rahim Gaziev, accused and spending many years in prison for selling out to the Armenians because there was no other explanation how Azerbaijanis could lose the formidable fortress of Shushi. He was a physicist. On the Armenian side, the Minister of Defense was Vazgen Manukyan, also a physicist. Is it just a freak coincidence or do we see something happening here? I would suggest that it was backbencher, you know, not front seat intellectuals, not the people who could sacrifice a lot, but the people who were kind of backbenchers, sipping coffee in Yerevan cafes, knowing that they would never make a great career because all positions had been taken in the USSR long ago. Well, it was ger gerontocracy, like Brezhnev, you know, these people were there forever, it seemed so, you know, old man on the mausoleum. And then something happens, we have democracy, and uh, they tried first, you have to pay attention to this, they tried first environmental protection. 
it kind of worked to a degree in Armenia because there was some uh, dirty anti-environmental plants in Yerevan, but lots of people lost jobs in the collapse of that chemical industry. Then they tried, you know, protecting historical monuments. Some people volunteered for that, but just some. And then the Karabakh issue, and booms, a million people come in the street. And the one who took the microphone and spoke to this crowd becomes president of Armenia and so forth. That explains to you why nationalism and why nationalism is no longer possible, in my opinion. Because it had already happened in the 1990s. Uh, time and again, somebody is trying to grab a microphone. There are plenty of microphones in Armenia. There are squares, but they never can bring a million people out, including yesterday, as I understand. That's where we are today. So we need something else, a different political strategy, which I'm not going to discuss now. But as you can see, nationalism, I think, was a one-shot affair. And it's over in this part of the world. Thank what you. Else? More questions are coming in. Uh, there's one from our uh, parents, uh, the, the extended UWC community. Do you see any possibility of a negotiated settlement in Artsakh in securing autonomy? Could you and play any role given the recognition they made years ago of Azerbaijan's claims of Artsakh, which was a terrible precedent? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm not a diplomat. As I already, I, I had many confessions to, uh, to make here. I'm not a poet. I'm not a romantic dreamer. I'm not a diplomat either. I'm professor of social studies. And I think there is zero or less than zero motivation on Azerbaijani side for any peaceful settlement because they can win. Why settle when you can win? You know, victory, however, is in the short run, is disposing of the population of Karabakh. And then basically, what do you do? You, know, you showed your strength to your domestic population. Uh, the same applies, by the way, to Mr. Erdogan and his nationalists. You know, remember you know, that he rather miraculously won re-election in May, last May. How could that happen? You know, and interestingly enough, neither the United Nations, let, let alone the European Union, raised any alarm Although we know that kind of you know, several million passports, Turkish passports were distributed, had been just before the election to the Syrian refugees and they all voted massively for Mr. Erdogan. How could that have? So let me just hint at this there. The guys in Ankara and in Baku are riding the wave of success as they see it. United Nations, you know, give me one example of United Nations success over the last 70 years, let alone the last 30 years. It was a great idea, however, very much like Mahatma Gandhi famously said, you know, what about British civilization? That that would be a great proposition. And I would say that United Nations was a great proposition. But what is the track record of United Nations? Seriously, or majority of its uh, subsidiary organizations. And I see no possibility. I have to be clear-minded here. You know, I don't see why would the dictator in Baku desire to stop and show weakness to his people, as he did stop in November 2020. At that time, okay, to reveal a small secret, a few old friends, and I have old friends in Azerbaijan and outside Azerbaijanis, called me through the third parties, through the third countries somewhere, in Europe, in America, and asked me, do you know what happened? Why did we stop? And all I could answer, you know, they, were, they were at a loss. All I could tell them, you know, that probably Russians, at that time, it was a different Russia. It was Russia before the defeat in Ukraine. Russians must have threatened something. That's the only plausible explanation I can imagine. Why? Not because Putin likes Armenians. 
but because he needed his garrison on the territory of Azerbaijan, the peacekeepers in Karabakh. Uh, because they felt you know, that otherwise Russia could be losing much more than just the Caucasus. It could be Tatarstan, you know, look at the map. Now, I just don't think you know, that anybody could have that kind of influence on Baku to stop them in their rage. Uh, that's why I think you know, the, the goal of Baku is quite straightforward. They want Karabakh and they don't want any population there, any Armenian population. Let, least of all, they would ever tolerate an autonomy. You know, and that's why they would never allow any outside observers there. Yeah. You know, so that's what we're operating on. The, these are the operational assumptions. Sorry, but it's grim, but we have to face this reality. Uh, related to the question, I mean, given the situation as it is, isn't or is there a responsibility on the part of the international community to protect I mean, this is a developing concept under humanitarian law, which has been exercised in other places, even outside the ambit of uh, the United Nations. Does the international community owe it to the people of Atsak? Look, your UWC school, Please don't even start me on this. The answer is clearly no. And as very intelligent and very cynical, famous American diplomat Henry Kissinger said, when you need to dial that international community, what's the phone number? Where do you appeal? Have you seen that international community in action? I'm sorry, be specific. When somebody was bombing in Libya, that was NATO. When anybody was sending troops to Kosovo, that was the NATO alliance prompted by the United States. If the United States decides, however, they will not decide because again, look at the map, Russia in, to the north of Azerbaijan, but what is the country to the south border of Azerbaijan? This is why that country is extremely jittery about what's happening in Karabakh, but I don't think that Iran has the capacity to intervene. Let me end here. Thank you. And uh, let it not be the last question, but uh, are we in that case in agreement with uh, neorealist thinking and near Scheimer that the world outside is in a state of anarchy? I mean, uh, John Mayer Scheimer is my old colleague. As you realize, I've taught in Chicago for a long time. John has been consistently wrong. And I can bring you know, many examples, you know, but what Mearsheimer, what Professor Mearsheimer espouses is a kind of ideology. It's kind of hard-nosed belief, uh, which very much like liberal internationals, uh, which is the opposite belief in American international relations. Um, School of International Relations, uh, follows very much the bipartisan thinking in the United States. There are always two parties. It's curious enough. It's not three, it's not five. There might be three soon, but it's always uh, somewhere to the left of the center and somewhere to the right of the center. It's realism, it's everyone for themselves, and it's kind of hard power, and it's soft power. It's Joseph Nye, something, you know, Harvard, Marvard, as some of our Armenian friends would say, it's soft power, it's uh, there. In reality, it's not about power, it's about interests. And we are at a moment, a terrifying moment actually in world history, when American hegemony is collapsing. This is what many dictators wanted to hear. It's, is it good news that they have lost the war in Iraq and you saw what happened in Afghanistan? Uh, this is what encouraged Moscow. But now Moscow is actually following in the footsteps. You know, they had a huge gambit, like the American invasion of Iraq, and that was a very important invasion. It was not just about Iraq, trust me. It was 
much, much bigger. It was about really the scheme of securing world order under the tutelage of one superpower for another hundred years. It could have worked. It just collapsed. You know, it happens, you know, such things happen. You know. Russia was going to uh, secure its tutelage, at least in the sphere of influence of the former Soviet confines. It is collapsing right now. And within this uh, situation, we see that realism uh, is kind of sounds or, or clash of civilizations, if you wish, also sound you know closer to reality. However, I would ask you know were there any other pro, uh, more promising periods in human history? Yes, when the United Nations was being formed, as I said, it was a great proposition in the end of Second World War. 1944-45, look into the original blueprint, like what John Maynard Keynes put behind you know, in the ideas of Bretton Woods system in finance and so forth. Uh, it was a much more optimistic uh, scenario. And this is when you know, international organizations were being formed. And it looked like there would be a rule of law. And the culmination was 1975, the Helsinki Conference uh, on Security in Europe, attended by all European nations. And at that time, 35 it was at the time, uh, because the Soviet Union has not collapsed yet. So what I would say that there is um, a sinusoid in history. There are moments when Mir Scheimer sounds more right. We are unfortunately in one of those moments when people have to believe in guns and money. There are moments, however, when internationalists sound more to the point. These are better moments in history. And it goes in sinusoid. We are close to the bottom right now. I hope that we are emerging from that bottom. That depends on many important actors in the West. They are not there. If they can get the act together, they might yet survive. But so far, survival of Armenia is up to Armenians. It's to your guns, it's to your resolve, and we have to face to the different difficult realities here. Thank you. Thank you, Georgi. In fact, I mean, uh, with you, uh, I think we can go indefinitely uh, with questions uh, and seek answers. In fact, uh, uh, if I may assume, I think we are ending the talk on uh, a slightly optimistic note, uh, despite the despair and despondency all around. I mean, I believe that if we've hit the bottom, as you say, uh, we will bounce back. I mean, that's the note of optimism that uh, I, but then there is a struggle ahead, as you rightly said. With these words, I mean, I, I, would I mean, much as we would have loved to go on, as I said, indefinitely with you, Georgie, uh, we will end this session today. And we certainly do look forward to have you again with us for another brilliant session, like the one today and the one before that. Thank you very much on, beha on behalf of all of us. And uh, Let's keep alive, let's keep alive our hopes. Thank you. Let me just tell the audience that the fact that probably my face is getting darker and darker, it's not only because I'm making grim predictions, it's because we have smart classrooms and the lights automatically are going off because I haven't been moving for an hour. So that's a signal. That is a signal, in fact, uh, and uh, thank you indeed. In, in fact, uh, I'm sure our, our audience has uh, benefited much from uh, your talk in understanding and putting the present situation in context, if I may put it that way. And uh, thank you once again on behalf of all of us, uh, not only the school community, but the larger UWC community uh, our parents, our well wishers, and the bigger community at large. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>